"'I wish ye'd get married, Roger,' said Catherine Ames. "'I'm getting too old to work. Seventy last April, and who's going to look after ye when I'm gone? Get married, by, get married.' Roger Temple winced. His aunt's harsh, disagreeable voice always jarred him horribly on his sensitive nerves. He was fond of her after fashion, but always that voice made him wonder if there could be anything harder to endure. Then he gave a bitter little laugh. "'Who'd have me, Aunt Catherine?' he asked. Catherine Ames looked at him critically across the supper-table. She loved him in her way, with all her heart, but she was not in the least blind to his defects. She did not mince matters with herself or with other people. Roger was a sallow, plain-featured fellow, small and insignificant-looking, and as if this were not bad enough, he walked with a slight limp and had one thin shoulder a little higher than the other. Jarback Temple he had been called in school, and the name still clung to him. To be sure, he had very fine gray eyes, but their dreamy brilliance gave his dull face an uncanny look which girls did not like, and so made matters rather worse than better. Of course, looks didn't matter so much in the case of a man. Steve Miller was homely enough and all marked up with smallpox to boot, yet he had got for a wife the prettiest and smartest girl in South Bay. But Steve was rich, Roger was poor, and always would be. He worked his stony little farm from which his father and grandfather had rested a fair living, after a fashion, but nature had not cut him out for a successful farmer. He hadn't the strength for it, and his heart wasn't in it. He'd rather be hanging over a book. Catherine secretly thought Roger's matrimonial chances very poor, but it would not do to discourage the buy. What he needed was spurring on. "'You'll get someone if you don't fly too high,' she announced loudly and cheerfully. "'There's always a gal or two here and thar that's glad to marry for a home. "'Tain't no use for you to be settin' your thoughts on anyone young and pretty. "'You wouldn't get her, and you'd be worse off if you did. "'Your grandfather married for looks and a nice useless wife he got. "'Sick half her time. "'Get a good strong girl that ain't afraid of work. "'That'll hold things together when ye are reading poetry. "'That's as much as you can expect. "'And the sooner the better. "'I'm done. "'Last winter's rheumatiz has about finished me.' and we can't afford hired help. Roger felt as if his raw, quivering soul were being seared. He looked at his aunt, curiously, at her broad, flat face with the mole on the end of her dumpy nose, the bristling hairs on her chin, the wrinkled yellow neck, the pale, protruding eyes, the coarse, good-humored mouth. She was so extremely ugly, and he had seen her across the table all his life. For twenty-five years he had looked at her so, must he continue to go on looking at ugliness in the shape of a wife all the rest of his life, he who worshipped beauty in everything? "'Did my mother look like you, Aunt Catherine?' he asked abruptly. His aunt stared and snorted. Her snort was meant to express kindly amusement, but it sounded like derision and contempt. "'Your ma wasn't no homely as me,' she said cheerfully, "'but she want no beauty either. None of the temples was ever better looking than was necessary.' We was workers. Your pa wa'n't bad looking. You're humlier than either of him. Some ways you take after your grandma, though she was counted pretty at one time. She was yaller and spindlin like you, and you've got her eyes. What you're so interested in your ma's looks all at once fur. I was wondering, said Roger coolly, if father ever looked at her across the table and wished she were prettier. Catherine giggled. Her giggle was ugly and disagreeable like everything else about her everything except a certain odd, loving, loyal old heart buried deep in her bosom, for the sake of which Roger endured the giggle and all the rest. To say he did, to say he did. Min all, always has a hankerm for good looks, but ye've got to cut your coat cordin' to your cloth. As for your poor ma, she didn't live long enough to get as ugly as me. When I come here to keep house for your pa, folks said, as it wouldn't be long for ye, he married me, I wouldn't a minded, but your pa never hinted it. Suppose you'd had enough ugly women likely. Catherine snorted amiably again. Roger got up. He couldn't endure any more just then. He must escape. Now you think over what I've said, his aunt called after him. You've got to get a wife soon, however you manage it. Twon't be so hard if you're reasonable. Don't stay out as late as you did last night. Ye coughed all night. Where was ye, down at the shore? No, said Roger, who always answered her questions even when he hated to. I was down at Aunt Isabel's grave. Till eleven o'clock? Ye ain't wise. I don't know what hankering ye have after that unchancy place. 
I ain't been near it for twenty years. I wonder ye ain't scared. What'd ye think ye'd do if ye saw her ghost? Catherine looked curiously at Roger. She was very superstitious, and she believed firmly in ghosts, and saw no absurdity in her question. I wish I could see it, said Roger, his great eyes flashing. He believed in ghosts, too, at least in Isabel Temple's ghost. His uncle had seen it. His grandfather had seen it. He believed he would see it, the beautiful, bewitching, mocking, luring ghost of lovely Isabel Temple. "'Don't wish such stuff,' said Catherine. "'Nobody never the same after they've seen her.' "'Was Uncle different?' Roger had come back into the kitchen and was looking curiously at his aunt. "'Different? He was another man. He didn't even look the same. Sitch eyes, always looking past ye at something behind ye. They'd give anyone creeps.' He never had any notion of flesh and blood women after that. Said a man wouldn't after seeing Isabel. His life was plum ruined. Lucky he died young. I hated to be in the same room with him. He want canny. That was all there was to it. You keep away from that grave. You don't want to look odder than ye are by nature, and when ye get married you'll have to give up roaming about half the night in graveyards. A wife wouldn't put up with it, as I've done. "'I'll never get as good a wife as you, Anna Catherine,' said Roger, with a little whimsical smile that gave him the look of an amused gnome. "'Des say you won't, but someone ye have to have. Why ain't ye try? Liza Adams. She might have ye. She's getting on.' "'Liza Adams? That's what I said. You don't repeat it. Liza Adamses. If I'd mentioned a hippopotamus, I get out of patience with ye. I believe in my heart ye think ye ought to get a wife that'd look like a picture.' I do, Aunt Catherine. That's just the kind of wife I want. Grace and beauty and charm. Nothing less than that will ever content me. Roger laughed bitterly again and went out. It was sunset. There was no work to do that night except to milk the cows, and his little home boy could do that. He felt a glad freedom. He put his hand in his pocket to see if his beloved Wordsworth was there, and then he took his way across the fields, under a sky of purple and amber, walking quickly despite his limp. He wanted to get to some solitary place where he could forget Aunt Catherine and her abominable suggestions and escape into the world of dreams where he habitually lived and where he found the loveliness he had not found nor could hope to find in his real world. Roger's mother had died when he was three and his father when he was eight. His little old bedridden grandmother had lived until he was twelve. He had loved her passionately. She had not been pretty in his remembrance, a tiny, shrunken, wrinkled thing, but she had beautiful gray eyes that never grew old, and a soft, gentle voice, the only woman's voice he had ever heard with pleasure. He was very critical as regards women's voices, and very sensitive to them. Nothing hurt him quite so much as an unlovely voice, not even unloveliness of face. Her death had left him desolate. She was the only human being who had ever understood him, he could never, he thought, have got through his tortured school days without her. After she died, he would not go to school. He was not in any sense educated. His father and grandfather had been illiterate men, and he had inherited their underdeveloped brain cells. But he loved poetry and read all he could get of it. It overlaid his primitive nature with a curious iridescence of fancy and furnished him with ideals and hungers his environment could never satisfy. He loved beauty in everything. Moonrises heard him with their loveliness, and he could sit for hours gazing at a white narcissus, much to his aunt's exasperation. He was solitary by nature. He felt horribly alone in a crowded building, but never in the woods or in the wild places along the shore. It was because of this that his aunt could not get him to go to church, which was a horror to her orthodox soul. He told her he would like to go to church if it were empty, but he could not bear it when it was full full of smug, ugly people. Most people, he thought, were ugly, though not so ugly as he was, and ugliness made him sick with repulsion. Now and then he saw a pretty girl at whom he liked to look, but he never saw one that wholly pleased him. To him, the homely, crippled, poverty-stricken Roger Temple, whom they all would have scorned, there was always a certain subtle something wanting, and the lack of it kept him heart-whole. He knew that this probably saved him from much suffering, but for all that he regretted it. He wanted to love, even vainly. He wanted to experience this passion of which the poet sang so much. Without it, 
He felt he lacked the key to a world of wonder. He even tried to fall in love. He went to church for several Sundays and sat where he could see beautiful Elsa Carey. She was lovely. It gave him pleasure to look at her. The gold of her hair was so bright and living, the pink of her cheek so pure, the curve of her neck so flawless, the lashes of her eyes so dark and silken. But he looked at her as at a picture. When he tried to think and dream of her, it bored him. Besides, he knew she had a rather nasal voice. He used to laugh sarcastically to himself over Elsa's feelings, if she had known how desperately he was trying to fall in love with her and failing. Elsa, the Queen of Hearts, who believed she had only to look to reign. He gave up trying at last, but he still longed to love. He knew he could never marry. He could not marry plainness, and beauty would have none of him. But he did not want to miss everything, and he had moments when he was very bitter and rebellious because he felt he must miss it forever. He went straight to Isabel Temple's grave in the remote shore field of his farm. Isabel Temple had lived and died eighty years ago. She had been very lovely, very willful, very fond of playing with the hearts of men. She had married William Temple, the brother of his great-grandfather, and as she stood in her white dress beside her bridegroom at the conclusion of the wedding ceremony, a jilted lover, crazed by despair, had entered the house and shot her dead. She had been buried in the shore field, where a square space had been diked off in the center for a burial lot, because the church was then so far away. With the passage of years the lot had grown up so thickly with fir and birch and wild cherry that it looked like a compact grove. A winding path led through it to its heart where Isabel Temple's grave was, thickly overgrown with long, silken, pale green grass. Roger hurried along the path and sat down on the big gray boulder by the grave looking about him with a long breath of delight. How lovely and witching and unearthly it was here. Little ferns were growing in the hollows and cracks of the big boulder where clay had lodged. Over Isabel Temple's crooked, leechen gravestone hung a young wild cherry in its delicate bloom. Above it, in a little space of sky left by the slender treetops, was a young moon. It was too dark here after all to read Wordsworth, but that did not matter. The place, with its moist air, its tang of fir balsam, was like a perfumed room where a man might dream dreams and see visions. There was a soft murmur of wind in the boughs over him, and the faraway moan of the sea on the bar crept in. Roger surrendered himself utterly to the charm of the place. When he entered that grove, he had left behind the realm of daylight and things known, and come into the realm of shadow and mystery and enchantment. Anything might happen anything might be true. Eighty long years had come and gone, but Isabel Temple, thus cruelly torn from life at the moment when it had promised her most, did not even yet rest calmly in her grave. Such at least was the story, and Roger believed it. It was in his blood to believe it. The Temples were a superstitious family, and there was nothing in Roger's upbringing to correct the tendency. His was not a skeptical or scientific mind. He was ignorant and poetical and credulous, He had always accepted unquestioningly the tale that Isabel Temple had been seen on earth long after the red clay was heaped over her murdered body. Her bridegroom had seen her when he went to visit her on the eve of his second and unhappy marriage. His grandfather had seen her. His grandmother, who had told him Isabel's story, had told him this too and believed it. She had added with a bitterness foreign to his idea of her that her husband had never been the same to her afterwards. His uncle had seen her and had lived and died a haunted man. It was only to men the lovely, restless ghost appeared, and her appearance boded no good to him who saw. Roger knew this, but he had a curious longing to see her. He had never avoided her grave as others of his tribe did. He loved the spot, and he believed that some time he would see Isabel Temple there. She came, so the story went, to one in each generation of the family. He gazed down at her sunken grave, A little wind that came stealing along the floor of the grove raised and swayed the long hair-like grass on it, giving the curious suggestion of something prisoned under it trying to draw a long breath and float upward. Then, when he lifted his eyes again, he saw her. She was standing behind the gravestone under the cherry tree, whose long white branches touched her head, standing there with her head drooping a little, but looking steadily at him. It was just between dusk and dark now, but he saw her very plainly. She was dressed in white with some filmy scarf 
over her head, and her hair hung in a dark, heavy braid over her shoulder. Her face was small and ivory white, and her eyes were very large and dark. Roger looked straight into them, and they did something to him, drew something out of him that was never to be his again, his heart, his soul. He did not know. He only knew that lovely Isabel Temple had now come to him, and that he was hers forever. For a few moments, that seemed years, he looked at her, looked till the lure of her eyes drew him to his feet as a man rises in sleepwalking. As he slowly stood up, the low-hanging boughs of a fir tree pushed his cap down over his face and blinded him. When he snatched it off, she was gone. Roger Temple did not go home that night till the spring dawn was in the sky. Catherine was sleepless with anxiety about him. When she heard him come up the stairs, she opened her door and peeped out. Roger went along the hall without seeing her. His brilliant eyes stared straight before him, and there was something in his face that made Catherine steal back to her bed with a little shiver of fear. He looked like his uncle. She did not ask him when they met at breakfast where or how he had spent the night. He had been dreading the question and was relieved beyond measure when it was not asked but, apart from that, he was hardly conscious of her presence. He ate and drank mechanically and voicelessly. When he had gone out, Catherine wagged her uncomely gray head ominously. "'He's bewitched,' she muttered. "'I know the signs. He's seen her. Drat her. It's time she gave up that kind of work. Well, I don't know what to do. There ain't nothing anything I can do. I reckon. He'll never marry now. I'm as sure of that as of any mortal thing. He's in love with a ghost.' It had not yet occurred to Roger that he was in love. He thought of nothing but Isabel Temple, her lovely, lovely face, sweeter than any picture he had ever seen or any ideal he had dreamed, her long dark hair, her slim form, and more than all her compelling eyes. He saw them wherever he looked. They drew him. He would have followed them to the end of the world, heedless of all else. He longed for night, that he might again steal to the grave in the haunted grove. She might come again. Who knew? He felt no fear, nothing but a terrible hunger to see her again. But she did not come that night, nor the next, nor the next. Two weeks went by, and he had not seen her. Perhaps he would never see her again. The thought filled him with anguish not to be born. He knew now that he loved her. Isabel Temple, dead for eighty years. This was love, this searing, torturing, intolerably sweet thing, this possession of body and soul and spirit. The poets had sung, but weakly of it. He could tell them better if he could find words. Could other men have loved it all? Could any men love those blousy common girls of earth? It seemed impossible, absurd. There was only one thing that could be loved, that white spirit. No wonder his uncle had died. He, Roger Temple, would soon die too. That would be well. Only the dead could woo Isabel. Meanwhile, he reveled in his torment and his happiness, so madly commingled that he never knew whether he was in heaven or hell. It was beautiful and dreadful and wonderful and exquisite, oh, so exquisite. Mortal love could never be so exquisite. He had never lived before. Now he lived in every fiber of his being. He was glad Aunt Catherine did not worry him with questions. He had feared she would, but she never asked any questions now, and she was afraid of Roger as she had been afraid of his uncle. She dared not ask questions. It was a thing that must not be tampered with. Who knew what she might hear if she asked him questions? She was very unhappy. Something dreadful had happened to her poor boy. He had been bewitched by that hussy. He would die as his uncle had died. Maybe it's best, she muttered. He's the last of the temples, so maybe she'll rest in her grave when she's killed them all. I don't know what she's such a spite at them for. There'd be more sense if she'd haunt the Mortons, seeing as a Morton killed her. Well, I'm mighty old and tired and worn out. It won't seem that it's been much use the way I've slaved and fussed to bring that boy up and keep things together for him. And now the ghost's got him. I might as well have let him die when he was a sickly baby. If this had been said to Roger, he would have retorted, that it was worth while to have lived long enough to feel what he was feeling now. He would not have missed it for a score of other men's lives. He had drunk of some immortal wine and was as a god. Even if she never came again, he had seen her once, 
and she had taught him life's great secret in that one unforgettable exchange of eyes. She was his, his in spite of his ugliness and his crooked shoulder. No man could ever take her from him. But she did come again. One evening when the darkening grove was full of magic in the light of the rising yellow moon, shining across the level field, Roger sat on the big boulder by the grave. The evening was very still. There was no sound save the echoes of noisy laughter that seemed to come up from the bay shore. Drunken fishermen, likely as not. Roger resented the intrusion of such a sound in such a place. It was a sacrilege. When he came here to dream of her, only the loveliest of muted sounds should be heard, the faintest whisper of trees, the half-heard, half-felt moan of surf, the airiest sigh of wind. He never read Wordsworth now, or any other book. He only sat there and thought of her, his great eyes alight, his pale face flushed with the wonder of his love. She slipped through the dark boughs like a moonbeam and stood by the stone. Again he saw her quite plainly, saw and drank her in with his eyes. He did not feel surprise. Something in him had known she would come again. He would not move a muscle lest he lose her as he had lost her before. They looked at each other for how long? He did not know, and then a horrible thing happened. Into that place of wonder and revelation and mystery reeled a hiccuping, laughing creature, a drunken sailor from a harbor ship with a leering face and desecrating breath. "'Oh, you're here, my dear. I thought I'd catch you yet,' he said. He caught hold of her. She screamed. Roger sprang forward and struck him in the face. In his fury of sudden rage the strength of ten seemed to animate his slender body and pass into his blow. The sailor reeled back and put up his hands. He was a coward, and even a brave man might have been daunted by that terrible white face and those blazing eyes. He backed down the path. "'Shorey, shorey,' he muttered. "'Didn't know she was your girl. Shorey, I butted in. Shettleman's never butt in. Shorey, sure, shorey.' He kept repeating his ridiculous shorey until he was out of the grove. Then he turned and ran stumblingly across the field. Roger did not follow. He went back to Isabel Temple's grave. The girl was lying across it. He thought she was unconscious. He stooped and picked her up. She was light and small, but she was warm flesh and blood. She clung uncertainly to him for a moment, and he felt her breath on his face. He did not speak. He was too sick at heart. She did not speak either. He did not think this strange until afterwards. He was incapable of thinking just then. He was dazed, wretched, lost. Presently he became aware that she was timidly pulling his arm. It seemed that she wanted him to go with her. She was evidently frightened of that brute. He must take her to safety. And then she moved on down the little path, and he followed. Out in the moonlit field he saw her clearly, with her drooping head, her flowing dark hair, her great brown eyes, she looked like the nymph of a wood-brook, a haunter of shadows, a creature sprung from the wild. But she was mortal maid, and he, what a fool he had been! Presently he would laugh at himself when this dazed agony should clear away from his brain. He followed her down the long field to the bay shore. Now and then she paused and looked back to see if he were coming, but she never spoke. When she reached the shore road she turned and went along it until they came to an old gray house, fronting the calm gray harbor. At its gate she paused. Roger knew now who she was. Catherine had told him about her a month ago. She was Lilith Barr, a girl of eighteen, who had come to live with her uncle and aunt. Her father had died some months before. She was absolutely deaf as a result of some accident in childhood, and she was, as his own eyes told him, exquisitely lovely in her white haunting style. But she was not Isabel Temple. He had tricked himself. He had lived in a fool's paradise. Oh, he must get away and laugh at himself. He left her at her gate, disregarding the little hand she put timidly out. But he did not laugh at himself. He went back to Isabel Temple's grave and flung himself down on it and cried like a boy. He wept his stormy, anguished soul out on it, and when he rose and went away, he believed it was forever. He thought he could never, never go there again. Catherine looked at him curiously the next morning. He looked wretched, haggard, and hollow-eyed. She knew he had not come in till the summer dawn, but he had lost the rapt, uncanny look she hated. Suddenly she no longer felt afraid of him. 
With this she began to ask questions again. "'What kept ye out so late again last night, boy?' she asked reproachfully. Roger looked at her in her mourning ugliness. He had not really seen her for weeks. Now she smote on his tortured senses, so long drugged with beauty, like a physical blow. He suddenly burst into a laughter that frightened her. "'Preserves, boy, have ye gone mad?' Or she added, "'Have ye seen Isabel Temple's ghost?' no said roger loudly and explosively don't talk any more about that damned ghost nobody ever saw it the whole story is balderdash he got up and went violently out leaving katherine aghast was it possible roger had sworn what on earth had come over the boy but come what had or come what would he no longer looked fay there was that much to be thankful for even an occasional oath was better than that katherine went stiffly about her dishwashing resolving to have Liza Adams to supper some night. For a week Roger lived in agony, an agony of shame and humiliation and self-contempt. Then, when the edge of his bitter disappointment wore away, he made another dreadful discovery. He still loved her and longed for her just as keenly as before. He wanted madly to see her, her flower-like face, her great asking eyes, the sleek braided flow of her hair. Ghost or woman, spirit or flesh, it mattered not. He could not live without her. At last his hunger for her drew him to the old gray house on the bay shore. He knew he was a fool. She would never look at him. He was only feeding the flame that must consume him. But go he must and did, seeking for his lost paradise. He did not see her when he went in, but Mrs. Barr received him kindly and talked about her in a pleasant, garrulous fashion which jarred on Roger. Yet he listened greedily. Lilith, her aunt, told him, had been made deaf by the accidental explosion of a gun when she was eight years old. She could not hear sound, but she could talk. A little, that is, not much, but enough to get along with. But she don't like talking, somehow. Dunno why. She's shy, and we think maybe she don't like to talk much because she can't hear her own voice. She don't ever speak except just when she has to. But she's been trained to lip-reading something wonderful. She can understand anything that's said when she can see the person that's talking. Still, it's a terrible drawback for the poor child. She's never had any real girl life, and she's dreadful sensitive and retiring. We can't get her to go out anywhere, only for lonely walks along shore by herself. We're much obliged for what you did the other night. It ain't safe for her to wander about alone as she does, but it ain't often anybody from the harbor gets up this far. She was dreadful upset about it, hasn't got over her scare yet. When Lilith came in, her ivory-white face went scarlet all over at the sight of Roger. She sat down in a shadowy corner. Mrs. Barr got up and went out. Roger was mute. He could find nothing to say. He could have talked glibly enough to Isabel Temple's ghost in some unearthly tryst by her grave, but he could not find a word to say to this slip of flesh and blood. He felt very foolish and absurd and very conscious of his twisted shoulder. What a fool he'd been to come. Then Lilith looked up at him and smiled, a little shy, friendly smile. Roger suddenly saw her not as the tantalizingly unreal mystic thing of the twilight grove, but as a little human creature, exquisitely pretty in her young moon beauty, longing for companionship. He got up, forgetting his ugliness, and went across the room to her. "'Will you come for a walk?' he said eagerly. He held out his hand like a child. As a child she stood up and took it. Like two children they went out and down the sunset shore. Roger was again incredibly happy. It was not the same happiness as had been his in that vanished fortnight. It was a homelier happiness, with its feet on the earth. The amazing thing was that he felt she was happy too, happy because she was walking with him, Jarback Temple, whom no girl had even thought about. A certain secret wellspring of fancy that had seemed dry welled up in him sparklingly again. Through the summer weeks the odd courtship went on. Roger talked to her as he had never talked to anyone. He did not find it in the least hard to talk to her, though her necessity of watching his face so closely while he talked bothered him occasionally. He felt that her intent gaze was reading his soul as well as his lips. She never talked much herself. What she did say she spoke so low that it was hardly above a whisper, but she had a voice as lovely as her face, sweet, candenced, haunting. 
Roger was quite mad about her, and he was horribly afraid that he could never get up enough courage to ask her to marry him, and he was afraid that if he did, she would never consent. In spite of her shy, eager welcomes, he could not believe she could care for him. For him? She liked him. She was sorry for him. But it was unthinkable that she, white, exquisite Lilith, could marry him and sit at his table and his hearth. He was a fool to dream of it. To the existence of romance and glamour in which he lived, no gossip of the countryside penetrated. Yet much gossip there was, and at last it came blundering in on Roger to destroy his fairy world a second time. He came downstairs one night in the twilight, ready to go to Lilith. His aunt and an old crony were talking in the kitchen. The crony was old, and Catherine, supposing Roger was out of the house, was talking loudly in that horrible voice of hers, which still more horrible zest and satisfaction. "'Yes, I'm guessing it'll be a match, as ye say. Oh, the boy's doing well. He ain't for every market, as I'm bound to admit. If she weren't deaf, she wouldn't look at him, no doubt. But... She has scads of money. They won't need to do a tap of work unless they like, and she's a good housekeeper, too, her aunt tells me. She's pretty enough to suit him. He's as particular as never was, and he wasn't crooked, and she wasn't deaf when they was born, so it's likely their children will be all right. I'm that proud when I think of the match. Roger fled out of the house, white of face and sick of heart. He went not to the bay shore, but to Isabel Temple's grave. He had never been there since the night when he had rescued Lilith, but now he rushed to it in his new agony. His aunt's horrible practicalities had filled him with disgust. They dragged his love in the dust of sordid things, and Lilith was rich. He had never known that, never suspected it. He could never ask her to marry him now. He must never see her again, for the second time he had lost her, and this second losing could not be borne. He sat down on the big boulder by the grave and dropped his poor gray face in his hands, moaning in anguish. Nothing was left him, not even dreams. He hoped he could soon die. He did not know how long he sat there. He did not know when she came. But when he lifted his miserable eyes, he saw her, sitting just a little way from him on the big stone and looking at him with something in her face that made his heart beat madly. He forgot Aunt Catherine's sacrilege. He forgot that he was a presumptuous fool. He bent forward and kissed her lips for the first time. The wonder of it loosed his bound tongue. Lilith he gasped, I love you. She put her hand into his and nestled closer to him. I thought you would have told me that long ago, she said. 